My name is Joseph Marzilliano and today I'm going to be walking you through my method of painting a miniature reproduction of my original sculpture of The Mandalorian. This piece is part of an ongoing project where I'm recreating multiple scenes from the show on Disney+. Make sure to like and subscribe to this video and my channel for more videos of this project and other art tips. In this video, I'm using a combination of Army Painter brand miniature paints and super cheap Craftsmart acrylic paints from Michaels. I find that the best value of the more expensive miniature paints are for the shade washes and metallics. I like to try to remember that you as the artist control the tools and the pigments, not the other way around. You could do a great sculpture with some sand at the beach, and you could do an amazing illustration with Crayola markers. And the expensive stuff works too. My workflow for this process is much more informed from a 2D painting mindset and approach. In this part of the video you can see that I'm trying to first cover the large parts of the model in the basic palette colors of the character's armor and clothing. Working from the large forms to the smaller ones allows me to be looser with my work and not sweat it if I make a mistake by getting paint somewhere that it shouldn't be at this stage. Also, this method helps me to not miss painting any small parts of the model. I actually go into greater detail about this loose and sketchy mindset in one of my previous videos, and I'll put a link to it above the, the top of the video. You'll notice that I'm doing two of the same models at once, and that's because I plan to display one of them by themselves, and the other will be going into a large multiple sculpture diorama with other characters from The Mandalorian. I'm a big proponent of expanding projects by a bit to get some extra practice with certain techniques, and in this case, palette combinations. Speaking of my palette, I'm using a custom-made wet palette, which is just a repurposed candle lid made of aluminum, if you layer a few sheets of wet paper towel onto the lid topped by copy paper, it acts as a really good way to keep your paints from drying out for hours before you use them. That's because the pigments, as they start to dry out from the air around them, will by osmosis pull the moisture from the wet palette into them. The video above from Miniac has a great method of constructing one of these at home. I like to make sure that I either use a pigment directly from the paint tube or mix enough of that custom pigment the first time around to cover the base layers of the bottle. That's because it can be very hard to match a custom paint color perfectly. Unlike digital art, there's no automatic color picker. And even using dropper bottles like I am here, every drop can be a variation of larger or smaller droplets. Usually this problem isn't experienced during the detailing or highlighting phase as I tend to mix too much pigment for those sections and end up wasting quite a bit of paint. Certain uneven textured surfaces like the cape require harsher brush strokes like wet stipling to ensure even coverage. I don't like to do that very often because it applies the paint in thicker coats than I'm usually comfortable with but here I'm not afraid of losing too much detail in the tattered cape. There's also something to be said in supports. It takes a fair amount of dexterity to use these small brushes accurately enough, and it makes it even harder holding the model in the other hand at the same time. So anytime you're working with a model large enough to stand on its own on a Lazy Susan, I'd recommend doing that. It makes it much easier for me. Also, temporarily sticking a model that's smaller onto a wider base makes it easier to hold in your offhand. During this painting session, it's a lot harder to hold one Mando by his appendages than the one that had the wooden base. It's best to try to put care into every part of the model you're painting. 
but it's also useful to realize that there is going to be a part of the model that is going to get the majority of the amount of attention. For me, I know that the jetpack makes sense for the overall silhouette of the piece, but it's not going to be the focal point. I'm not going to use the back of the sculpture um, either as a prominent part of the display by itself or even in a diorama. So because of that, I didn't go out of my way to overly detail the jetpack or the backside of the cape or the back of Mando's helmet. Once I got those base coats on there and had the right colors that I needed, um, in this case being a gray undercoat and then a silver overcoat, that was all that I really needed there. The trickiest part of painting these models was where I broke from the format of how I approach model painting. You can see how I jumped the gun here and applied brown paint to the leather bandolier across Mando's chest before painting the larger form of the chest gray. This slowed me down considerably by then trying to paint around the strap instead of dropping that brown paint in on the second coat. This is a good lesson I learned in why patience in art makes for faster, better work. So please, don't repeat my mistakes. With a muted palette like Mando's, I felt compelled to mix a lighter shade of mustard desert brown for the highlighted parts of the model. Remember that the highlighted parts of the model are always going to be about a mid-tone brighter and less saturated than the base. The easy part with the sculpture, as opposed to painting in 2D, is that the highlights are almost always going to be the top orientation of your model, unless you plan to have a custom light source somewhere else. Even then, the actual light you shine on the piece and the shadows falling from that light onto the sculpture is going to do a lot of that work for you. I generally ignore painting in shadows but I will use a shade wash to artificially get some darkness in the creases between armor plates or the folds on clothing. Shade washes can be expensive, but a cheap homemade alternative is to mix a drop or two of black paint with dish soap to act as a thinner end of flow aid. The video above has a whole recipe for it. There are a lot of great resources on YouTube for model painting and miniature painting, and I highly recommend channels like Black Magic Craft for tips to do phenomenal work painting small sculptures and scale model buildings. I'd also like to talk for a second about characters that you might be creating from scratch. It can be very hard to design a character sketch, but then find yourself stuck when selecting where each color in your palette is going to be placed on the model. I didn't design the color scheme of Mando, but it offers us a really wonderful insight into how to make these decisions. You can see by this point of the painting that we have a multiple brown areas and multiple gray silver areas. If we painted half of him brown and half of him silver, it would be somewhat appealing, but your eye would lose interest quickly. The colors would work together, but, but they, they wouldn't create a whole piece that you'd want to see for very long. A concept art trick that I love to employ is done when you take those browns and silver sections and they're broken up by one another. For example, the silver head and chest leads to brown belts and pants broken up by silver leg plates and brown boots, so on and so forth. If you look a layer deeper, those browns and silvers are broken up within variations as well. Did you notice how I selected a different base brown for the leather boots and belts and another brown for the pants and shirt? Seeing all the dark colors used in the palette, you'd think that it would be a hard question to ask where the darkest part of these models are. The answer is the only place on them that I used a true or nearly true black, which is the eyes 
and the face of the helmet. However, if I asked you what stands out the most on these models, you would probably say that your eye is drawn most to the face of the helmet, even though it's the darkest part. Just like in Renaissance works by the old masters, the eye is drawn to the place of greatest contrast, even if that greatest contrast is the darkest part of the piece.